Guys, what's going on? We have a very special treat. We have my friend Larry Nemechek. He is Dr. Trek. You might have seen him at numerous conferences. I mean, that's where I've seen him several times now. Um, I first heard about Larry because if people are seeing the video, he wrote this phenomenal book, Star Trek, The Next Generation Companion. You need to raise it. You're out of frame. There you Star go. Star Trek, The Next Generation Companion. There you go, everyone. Check it out. All it's the way up. All the way up. <laughs> Oh, that's the Zoom blur. But anyways, anyone can see it. Star Trek, The Next Generation Companion. Um, it is a phenomenal book. And it is, yeah, he has been in the Star Trek game for, gosh, over 25, 30 plus years. I'm going to read a few blurbs from his website because a person of his stature definitely deserves a proper um, overview. Um, author, interviewer, host, arc archivist, producer, voiceover actor, and fan, Larry Nemechek has a background in news and theater, but it is Trekland where he has worked for over 25 years. A renowned Star Trek authority, Larry is the author of the best-selling classic, Star Trek The Next Generation Companion, which I just shared, and a regular convention guest worldwide, often referred to as Dr. Trek. Larry now brings his Trek insights resources and archives to the ultimate deep dive experience with Trek fans on Portal 47, which I'm a very proud member of. And yeah, you know, normally I, when you have someone who under, who lives and breathes Star Trek, yeah, we can geek out on different episodes, different characters, which we will likely in this conversation, but I really want to go deeper into Larry's love affair for Star Trek. And in particular, um, why he feels it's important to stay on top of Star Trek and how it can help the world and what we can learn from from life from watching Star oh, Trek. Wow. wow. Well, hi, Ash. Hey. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> That's a lot kidding. to come back from. And 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 thankfully you didn't read but maybe like a, a half of that or whatever. <laughs> um no, this is it's really interesting the way life has played out because when I was a kid, I mean, I I was one of those kids that had an interest in all kinds of things. And I did all kinds of things after the I mean, by the time I was like in grade school and junior high, I was I didn't think about it, but I became like a real big history fan and a big history buff and a map nerd. And, uh, you know, just and I loved American history. And I love I mean, my my folks were my parents were of the generation, the, the Depression, World War Two generation. So my dad was a World War II veteran. My mom was like 10 years younger than him. So she was almost a generation behind him in some ways. But, um, you know, the 30s and the 20s and the 30s and the 40s were always like a real, my my place I really loved, I guess, because it was like parents and before. But I just was always keen that way. And I never understood why people would not want to know history. You know, the old thing about, you know, you'd better know history, you'll be doomed to repeat it. That's bad, you know, translation. And I never got why anybody would want to do anything over again stupidly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and then at the same time, I was this back in the day, we'd say I was a big hobby. We didn't say nerd and and uh, and dweeb and all that stuff. It was I was a hobbyist and I had a lot of hobbies, but I was a, I like collected stamps and built models, especially rockets. And I built I was a model railroader. And I cared more about building the structures and scenery and the cars than I did about running the trains. <laughs> I never actually built a layout, but I had a plan. And I built structures for the, you know, and I learned the architectural, like how to do plaster and lay down grass and, pay, you know, do all the model building stuff. And um, and I did model rockets and, uh, and all of that kind of thing. And I said, stamp, yeah. So, and stamps tied into like the geography history nerd side and, I just I just enjoyed all that stuff. And I did well in school. I was a little, uh, you know, went for a few years, not honestly not having a lot of friends, but I wasn't like just the chummiest, I guess, looking back at yourself when you're a kid. And then probably early junior high was rough that way. But then I also my mom had forced me into taking piano lessons. And by the time I was in high school and we were doing a lot of pop music stuff and um, and doing piano and and talking and then by the time I was in high school I decided I wanted to take speech and journalism so uh, I did and then I wound up going to college at a school that didn't have a major for journalism which is what I decided on so I majored in theater 
and a minor in journalism. Anyway, it's, so it's like I've always had way too much stuff going on or, you know, making my brain go or whatever. So that's so in the middle of all that, this famous story I tell about my ninth grade teacher one day. Long story short, shaming me into watching Star Trek after school. And I didn't think about it. It was it was fun. And it was like all the other million things you were doing. It was fun. But I got going to the point where after a while it had I realized it had pulled me in. And I didn't think about that until I started looking around for, you know, books and whatever, magazines and stuff. And I was a rerun baby. So things like the making of Star Trek and the tech manual and the blueprints and, you know, that was all there was. But I was there when the new stuff came out, like, oh, the medical reference. Ooh, ooh. And and the giant poster book and that kind of thing. And at some point I was wanting to buy stuff. I should, I'll tell, I promise you I'll take a breath here in a minute. I wanted to buy stuff. And one day I sat down and I was looking at the Lincoln Enterprise catalog and some of the other catalogs. And it was like, you could get Kirk t-shirts and posters and you could get Spock and you could get the ship and you could get a crew shot maybe, but you couldn't get like a Scotty and you couldn't get like a McCoy shirt. You couldn't get an Uhura or, you know, and I was just like, huh. And, and the more I watched and went through the cycles and I got to where I was taking notes and, you know, we didn't have VCRs. All you could do was you, if you were really into it, you would put up a, a an audio recorder on your little cassette recorder because that was the cool, you know, media at the time, all we had and what we could do. But I would like record audio tapes of the shows. And of course, your local station butchers them. So there's that. But I uh I started realizing that um that some of the, you know, like Kirk and Spot get all the attention. And I was like, Well, what about Scotty? And what about McCoy, especially McCoy? Yeah. And I guess I've always been a big defender of the underdog i say this this is why i was always a big tellerite and andorian fan and then the andorians got their due so now it's tell yeah but i i um and then the more i thought about it i was like yeah kirk and spock get all the attention and mccoy saves the day half the time and he has the better lines yeah you know? so anyway so that's just that's just kind of where i was it wasn't that i sat there and said okay i'm gonna do this because i had no idea what i was gonna do for a job and i was like in you know it drove me crazy to pick a major it drove me crazy to go where to go to school, but I finally just went with it. And half of me wanted to teach school because I have millions of cousins and I, I enjoy talking to, you know, part of me wanted to save the world from from stupid history teachers that weren't teaching history well and made it dull, dull and boring. And I wanted to be alive and mean something. And then on the side, I could teach journalism and 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 theater too, at least to high school kids, maybe. But I didn't do that. I wound up going, getting a job um, in news at the beginning at the Norman Transcript uh, back at home. But it was a daily paper. Well, it was a weekly paper, too, that I filled in on the side first in summer school and times. And then I got out of grad school and, and did news for 10 years. But that was the 10 years when Star Trek boomed again and came back yeah. from the dead with Next Gen. So anyway, that led to this Next Generation companion and me self-publishing what I enjoyed doing, which was B. Joe's Companion and and all those kind of books. But I thought, I mean, I filled in my own, did my own notes on all the old stuff. But then I thought when Next Gen came that I, I'm going to start doing my own. I'm going to learn how Mac computers work and learn some, some software and catch up that way. And we had laser printers now so you could do desktop publishing. And it was, you know, it was a new era. And I thought I'll jump on it and try to be fresh. And long story, no, not so long story short, the concordances that I were doing wound up with the writers that got them the attention of Paramount. And eventually, you know, um, the Next Generation Companion happened. Yep. Even though it wasn't an encyclopedia, it was a making of behind the scenes that I had a book all written, but it had to be that because the Akutas were doing the encyclopedia. So by that time, I'm saying, sure, sure, I'll do it. And in three months, I got the it stretched to six months. I got the blue edition of the companion done. But by then, I'd been to L.A. and we had decided to move to L.A. and Star Trek was booming. And I thought, well, I can always go work in journalism. If this doesn't pan out and there aren't more projects to happen, um, I can always go back into journalism and all of that. So we moved from Oklahoma to uh, L.A. and we've been here ever since. In the, in the good in the good times and in the fallow times with Star Trek. So was there a philosophy that you watched 
in you watch Star Trek in your high school and early 20s and maybe 30s prior to getting this book done that kind of made you say, you know what, like subconsciously, this is like a guide for me to stay the course because you mentioned so many things which are uncertain. Like, I don't know if I'm going to get another job. I don't know if the Star Trek thing will work out. I don't know if this companion book was going to get picked up and it did get picked up, thankfully. But is there any philosophy that or any character that inspired you to like like a hero of some sort or anything they did? Yeah. Well, I mentioned one thing. I've I I it's amazing how you just start you just start thinking things and sometimes yeah. you have to let years go by before you I say physically, before you consciously identify it when you say philosophies. And one of them I I just remember being a kid and I won't mention, you know, specific whatever's, but I just remember at one point realizing where I grew up you know, going to church was a big thing. And then as I got into high school, junior high and high school, I realized what the word hypocrisy meant, <laughs> you know, and just because, so that's not really a philosophy, but it was just kind of like the little things when you're a kid, you're taught everything from like what you're taught in history to what you're just taught about people in general and how we get along and some are things that you weren't taught or there was a vacuum. And I just remember at some point and not just tying it to, to religions and, denom and formal religion, I'll say. But just realizing how, you know, just because people say something doesn't mean that's what they're going to, they really do, or or they say on the surface, but not in their heart. And just realizing to be aware of, I mean, like to, you know, to agree, my hero hero is Will Rogers, who I didn't realize was just an Oklahoman that I grew up with and then became a huge fan when I was in high school. And I didn't get to do anything in Oklahoma, but now that I'm out here in California, I have been a docent at the Will Rogers Historic State Park with his ranch house and his LA home um, for 20 something years. And the last couple of years, I was invited on the board for the Will Rogers Ranch Foundation. Wow. It's a nonprofit that supports state parks. So and this cool. year I got elected president of that. So I have a not Star Trek life. Thank you very much. But it was the, um, the author, Terry Rio, who, who wrote D. Forrest Kelly's biography. He's the only one that didn't do an autobiography, right? Yep. So she wrote his book and talked to me and she was a big fan of the house too, but of, of Will's house. But she said, I get it why you're such a big fan of McCoy and DeForest Kelly and Will Rogers, and they have a lot of similar traits. And one of the things I always loved about McCoy and, and Dee's portrayal of him, and Carl Urban did a great job too, was, and I, and I heard this, in, sometimes it's like a parody. There used to be all kinds of great satires and parodies, 70s and the 80s and the 90s on, on Star Trek. And there still are. We have Facebook and memes. But the ones where they would talk, where it was like Kirk and Spock would be the big heroes. And everybody all, how do people parody McCoy? They always love to have him, you know, like, I'm a doctor. Like doctor, damn it. And yeah. yelling and <laughs> being a curmudgeon and all that. But see, when I was growing up, and I've even thought later on that maybe parts of my dad reminded or McCoy reminded me of my dad, which would be really weird. But that's only come to me in the last few years because people, average Trek fans, look at McCoy and they think of the gripey guy, the, the screamer guy, the overly emotional one and the curmudgeon. And that was never the way D was to, or McCoy was to me. McCoy to me was always the one who was grounded. And who was not a bleeding heart, but he was the one that was the, oh, come on, guys, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. You know, he was the one that was the down to earth one. And if everybody got a little too full of themselves, he could pop the bubbles. Does that make sense? Dude, I love what you said. McCoy is probably my second favorite character on the original series. Kirk is my favorite, but McCoy is without a doubt my number two. And one of the reasons why is because he's always able to human and humanize or ground Kirk and the rest of the crew and even give a little more emotion to Spock without Spock realizing it. And so I love, I love Bones. I mean, he's, he's such a yeah. wonderful character and he has such a compassionate, kind heart. You definitely saw that in, um, you know, when, whenever Bones is trying to help a patient and how, how passionate he gets, even if he couldn't save the patient, even if it's the Klingon chancellor, you saw how compassion he was when he was on trial you're just like this guy cares you can't send this guy away to jail or die yeah well it was a monkey trial but but yeah i mean everybody but see, that's and that's the way people have always talked about mccoy at the oh he's the you know when they talk about the triad and the you know kirk is action and spock is intellect and mccoy is heart 
but that that doesn't like that doesn't do it justice do mccoy justice and um he has his aside from the fact that every other week they couldn't decide if mccoy was a great scrappy fighter or if he was totally a clueless fighter when they'd have a token you know little fracas and either somebody had to come rescue him or he was doing just fine it, you know it was either like spock had to help him in the arena on 892.4 and bread and circuses because you know i am defending myself or he's just you know, knocking people out, and they don't they don't make a big deal out of it because uh, the mo- the plot has to move on. <laughs> okay, you three guys knock these three guys out, and then we'll you know take them over, and then we'll move on. And I'm like, yeah. wait, he's doing just fine right there, but it wasn't like a plot point. It wasn't a funny line. No, but I I um part of that is like he's the and some people would say he was very cynical, and some people would say, oh, cynic is just a, a romantic with a you know that's that's got scar tissue or something, and that's that's partly me also but mccoy was just the one who would point things out where everybody got carried away and i think that's that's one of my one of my personal things and i just found that in mccoy and without even thinking about it that's that's what i enjoyed of course will rogers made a career out of making people laugh and pointing yep. out the obvious and he was really the first stand-up comic pundit when that was when all these things were being invented that's one thing about star trek it's like you enjoyed parts of it before there was a word for it. And now we have the buzzwords. And like, I look back now and, and say uh, what sucked me in in the beginning was also the fact that they had a continuity. They had a canon. And it was like that they took kind, you know, they sure they messed up at, at times, but they took such pains. I mean, I remember that I specifically remember the day, my two best friends, I think we were in high school in geometry and we'd had an argument over and we all watched Star Trek after school, and we were arguing about whether the patches match the color shirts all the time. <laughs> and I said, "Yes, they do." And they were like, "No, they don't. They can't possibly." And I remember when the tech manual came out, and I went home and I was like, "See, you know, there's the command, the sciences, and the engineering ops." And I said, "See, see, they do match the shirt colors." But it was like it was that kind of thing. It was like, "Oh, oh so today, I think we call that like well, canonistas." But I mean, today they talk about world building. You know, and they the authors and cre- any kind of creator that's creating a story for whatever media, you know, and you go to panels at cons and, you know, like how to build, how to insist on continuity for your world building. I mean, and it's a thing and we talk about it. But back in the day, you know, Gene and Gene and Gene and Dorothy Fontana and Bob Justman and all of them were just writing those memos that were amazing to read and they were trying to keep things consistent. And that's, Without thinking, oh, I enjoy Star Trek because everything's consistent. I just took it and ran with it. That's part of me. Also, I'll I'll assume a lot of things. I assumed when I read Gene saying, well, of course we have to get along or else we'll blow ourselves up and we'll never get to space. And I'm like, well, yeah, we'll, we'll never have this in 300 years if we don't learn to get along now. That's that's rational. That's logical. OK, moving on. But yeah. for a lot of people, that's where they I mean, that was the that was the mind blowing thing. You know, the people that wrote zines and wrote essays and, and fan fiction, they couldn't get over the fact that Spock was so rational and people, you know, emotion didn't destroy his life or the people around him or he wouldn't let other people's out of control emotions. And I'm like, well, yeah, OK, moving on. And it, it, it was amazing to me because then I thought something was wrong with me when I started to get into layers of fandom and I'd see the, the Interstat, which was like a, a letters of comment zine, which was pre-internet. This is how. People talk to each other on a higher level. And I don't want to be elitist. I'm just saying people that wanted more and were on a deeper level. Like the, the old fan, the, the vanguard of fan leaders, which was mostly women and mostly coming out of the zines at that time. And every once in a while, like I'd write a letter and I'd say, oh, and I'd be talking, basically I'd be talking about uh, Andorians or Tellarites or McCoy or something, something, ships, planets. And, you know, like one or two other people in that issue would respond to me. And I'd say, OK, there's eight people in the country that care what I care about. Yeah. And I, I cared about Spock, but I couldn't see 40 people going back and forth all this time about Spock. Just I was like, OK, that's your you know, and that's your I didn't gatekeep. I was more like a maze keep. I was like, OK, I'm just in this eternal little minority over here. So philosophy wise, one of my things was everybody has I don't know. And part of this is just in me, I guess. But it's. Some of the things about Star Trek, you know, infinite diversity, infinite combinations. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah, 
if we don't, then we kill ourselves, blow ourselves up, we kill the planet, and we don't get out to do all the fun stuff like explore. So why would you want to do that? You know, and and so idic, if you want to call that a philosophy, and just uh, just diversity and finding, you know, getting along with everybody, whatever you want to call that, the golden rule. I don't know. That was kind of like, well, yeah, who wants to die? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, this should be like obvious. And then when you when you come across something that cuts that way, my way. I always, instead of like doing what people expect you to do, which has been helpful for the last 10, 15, 20 years of politics, like I try to come in at a, at a different angle that throws people off instead of doing what they expect you to say. So anyway, I, I, I uh, the thing about, you know, study history, like we just went through world wars. We look at anything in history where somebody was a horrible person, millions of people died, something almost didn't happen. And then look at what happens when the world progresses. What's the difference? You know, yeah. So anyway, so a lot of that. So my science, my NASA space kid, which I was a bit had NASA posters on my wall too. My NASA kid and my history kid found this weird future projection in Star Trek, and all these you say philosophies. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's like and listen, listen to everybody. Don't chop people down the minute they jump up to say. I maybe I've failed that sometimes, but I. So I don't know. I don't. When you say philosophies, I don't know. I don't know about putting a, you know, like a brass plaque and putting a frame around them, but it's just, you know, like everybody, everybody has something to put in. Maybe somebody's got a hundred times more different things to put in the yeah. pot than this person does, but everybody's got something, if nothing else, their own story. And maybe it's a tragic story, but it's something to add in to learn from. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying because, um, Star Trek is this ever evolving project where, yes, there was a couple visionaries, Gene being the initial visionary, and then his team, Gene and Dorothy and everyone else. And then as the show progressed and new series evolved, you now have other visionaries. It's like this collective vision that keeps on improving or evolving. And that's what you're saying to me. And I appreciate that. And that's, I think that's why Star Trek over the years seems to get stronger and stronger maybe there's uh, in your opinion how has the star trek culture when i say culture like you and us are, you and i are part of the culture the movement of star trek how have you seen it evolve from the next generation to now i mean you've been to quite a lot of events and you've done a lot of talks you've written books walk me through that whole trajectory <laughs> um well one thing it's one another thing. I don't know if this is a philosophy, but one thing I I like to go with also is the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, something that I see every it, it, this happens in politics. This happens in you know pop culture. This happens in just the the goofy stuff around the way you live your life. But and I don't know if it's because I was a history nerd and because I was. I was in the younger end of my my two families. I had big families on both sides, my dad's family especially. And I never – when I was a kid, I was a kid. I never – I didn't know how income tax worked. I didn't know how to drive a car. I didn't know how all this complicated adult stuff – I didn't fear for it. As I got closer to high school and college, I was kind of like, oh, my God, like picking – you know, suddenly you have to you know, stop being a kid, being adult now. Thankfully, I got over that because – but for a while when I was 17, 18, I was like, oh, geez, I've got to plan the rest of my life now. And it's like, no, that's not that's not how this works. Even when you try to do that, that that's not the way it happens. But on a personal level and then even getting out with other people and then talking about everything from politics to Star Trek and all these other things, it's like you care about something in the moment. But when you talk to people that have lived, like you look at what Will might have said at the end, or lots of philosophers, and or even longtime politicians, or other people that have been in something for a long time and they have that scope of perspective. It's like if you get excited about something, I, I, I when I was acting and I got to be Grandpa Vanderhoff, and you can't take it with you. And he has a great speech about this. When he was a young guy, he got all excited about whether Cleveland or Blaine was going to be elected president, and now it's like. It's not that he doesn't care, but it's just like whatever you do in the moment, you know, fight for your for your cause, for your thing. But just know that if you lose, just it's like Oklahoma weather. Just wait five or 10 years 
and it's going to come around again the other way. And it, what was hit me in the 90s was suddenly when Next Generation and that, that universe was cool and hot. And the original series, I felt sorry. The original series actors were like not – nobody cared, seemed to care about Jimmy and Nichelle and Walter and George out on the con circuit. And they weren't out so much. And everybody was all full of, you know, it was the heady years, next generation and first contact and and DS9 launching and Voyager launching. And it's kind of like everybody was, oh yeah, the old 60s. Yeah, the old 60s. And then what happens? It's like then the pendulum swings. And by the time of of trials and tribulations and all that, the 60s are retro cool. That was the buzzword. And and then what happens when when uh, Enterprise ends and things have kind of atrophied with the current shows, and people are feeling a little eh? Um, every you know suddenly J.J. Abrams goes well let's let's go back to let's go back to the roots Kirk and Spock and suddenly everything sixties is even more than retro cool again. It's the only savior for the franchise is to go back and redo it a different way, but go back there again. And it's kind of like okay, well this is really not. I'd rather have some new stuff, but okay. <laughs> Why are we having to redo this again and do it in a fake way? Okay. I mean, that was just me personally talking. But the biggest thing out of this, and now we've had it even more so. Now the Kelvin movies are old hat. And then Discovery starts. And now Discovery's old hat. And, you know, it's like the pendulum swings. It, in the beginning, nobody could keep up with DS9 because it was on the crappy channels. And the more it went along, the more it was, you know, micro serialized and people threw up their hands. Because like there'd be a long term arc of for fifteen characters, you know, and and if you missed one show, you might have missed something, and and if you missed two in a row, I remember people saying, "I've missed two DS nines now. I'm just going to give up. I can't keep up." And you know, we didn't have binge watching, and you didn't, you know, you you were only watching. Even if you were taping your shows, it felt like you're behind or something. And look at how we look at DS nine now. Now it's the oh, it's the one that stood the test of time the most, and it's the one that presaged binge watching and serialized. You know? I heard that. Yeah. I so, heard that. so one of the things yeah. to be about Star Trek that also reflects out into the real world is do what you, you know, believe what you want, love what you want, but just know that in five or 10 years, not only is it going to go around to the backside of the moon and something else is going to be in the spotlight, but you're going to find people, the thing that you love because you grew up on it or it was your first Star Trek, then you're going to have people that go, eh. Or I don't know. Are they looking at it? And you know, people are looking at original series with with modern lenses and talking about you know, Kirk as a womanizer and and McCoy slapped that woman. And I'm like, well, that was cartoon violence. That was a that was a joke, and she slapped him back, and it was equality. What do you mean? You know, I mean, and and next gen, it's happening to next gen too. But all these, you know, if you if something upsets you, number one, it's probably somebody who's I'm gonna I don't want to ageist this but it's probably someone who's younger and hasn't had as much life experience yet but listen give you know they have value what they think is what they think and if you can engage and talk and bring some things up that's one thing but sometimes the way they if that's a belief of theirs you may not change their mind until they've had another 10 or 20 years to live and just have been through life and and you know look at things because people go back now and look at how they thought those shows in the 90s were or even this, even the original series, and they go, "Oh, well, I see it differently now that I did then," which is true of anything. It's like when you're a kid and you see what your parents did, and now you're a parent, and you, you know, that's up. But to apply it to something, because very few things have been around as long as Star Trek as an entertainment vehicle. So that's that's one of the things that. So now, in the heat of the moment, when people talk about this is cool or this isn't cool or this was, you know. Or you're just like it's just member berries. It's just nostalgia porn for you. It's like, well, nostalgia porn. <laughs> let's just hold on. Let's just, you know, it's like the pendulum is going to swing back. So if you're, if you feel like you've been pushed yeah. into the minority closet over here, like just hang on. Six or eight years from now, maybe you'll things will switch around and it'll be. It's like I was laughing about serialized shows and the very discovery and people didn't like that storytelling. And I said, guys, let them have four or five shows. And then somebody's going to jump up and say, I've got a brilliant idea. Let's just have episodes that stand by themselves and aren't part of an arc. And they'll think it's new. And that's fine. We'll let them. And I was like laughing and going, well, you've had Discovery, Picard, uh, Lower Decks, Prodigy. And oh, look, Strange New Worlds was the fifth show. <laughs> that's funny. Anyway, now I'm not yeah. claiming any genius here. I'm just saying it's human nature. Yeah. So that's, that's the one thing. Um, 
that's but that's the McCoy in me, and that's the Will Rogers in me, I think. Or that's what you know. After all these years of connecting all these dots, that's one of the one of the things. So one thing that fascinates me about Star Trek is, and one of the reasons why I do these interviews about Star Trek is, I feel that Star Trek can give us answers to things that we deal with in society you talk about history i agree there's a lot of things in history we can learn from our own mistakes or learn from our own opportunities or continue to do something if it's going well um, from history are there certain things in star trek that you feel um in this particular day and age we could one should apply or, or revisit just to help them think about problems or issues that might mean something to them and this could be stuff that means something to you and you're like well star trek kind of gives me a take on it that could maybe others should see this take too yeah well when you say history i mean uh, maybe specific episodes but the thing that one of the other things besides the world building later on when people would i got to college and i had to do speeches you know and we'd have to write essays and all of a sudden i had to like think about this and like make yourself think but part of it was, aside from enjoying this this made world that was fairly consistent, and it wasn't sloppy, sloppily put together, right? Uh, con- and especially with what there was in science fiction on screen to that was multiply made, like not a one-off movie, but uh, what did you have for series that was run- running characters? Twilight Zone wasn't running characters. All you had was Lost in Space at the time. And then in the 70s, because of Star Trek, you had um space 1999 and you had it you had a few things but even like star wars when it came along we're still one-off movies and you had one or two or three of them okay well now you've got six hours in this universe of film you know it was still but aside from that that fairly continuous world the other thing i loved that they did and this was not like keeping score against star wars being a, a galaxy far far away a long time ago but i would love it when kirk would do a line kirk is speechifying and he would say, um, think about it. Uh, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler, Lee Kwan, Colonel Green, you know? And I was like, oh, and you would get it. But it was always a reminder that they were us, you know? And it wasn't like a big deal. Oh, look, we're we're them in the future. I mean, that was part of it. And, or the, uh, you know, the way they would do the nautical in NASA. I mean, there were always reminders and history was one of the big ones. And I know they went to the thing about, oh, Kirk was an American history fan. Oh, look, he's conjured up Lincoln. Oh, look, he's <laughs> <laughs> he's done this. But they always would hark back to the fact that uh, – and I don't say this to be like American. I love it. Star Trek became global accidentally, and that's a good thing. But now a lot of a lot of the global fans, and a lot of them I have in Portal and on Trekland Tuesdays Live – uh, and they're always and they it's like they almost forget that this was an American product make, coming out of American capitalism as much as Gene tried to fight that, you know, and and have it rise above just selling tires and toothpaste. But it's like, well, it started it's, it was like an American show. So the things are going to skew like when they go back in time, they until this recent show when they went to Toronto, you know, on 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 Strange New Worlds. But yes, they're going back to Florida and New York and California and the Omaha Air Base, you know. And um, it's it's like, yeah, it is American. But but even so, it's of us. And that was a thing that I always thought was cool. And they didn't have so they didn't have to get up and speechify about it. He would just say something in shorthand and we would get it. So. I forget what you asked me specifically, but that was one of the things that um, you said. Yeah, what are some history. what are some things about what are some things we can learn from Star Trek that can apply to? Oh yeah, things in yeah. life. I well, you know, like the 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 most obvious thing is itic. It's like that is a little brass plaque in a frames, you know. Which at the time I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> if we don't, if we if we have an if we have a World War Three and we blow ourselves up, what's the fun in that? You know, like how how short sighted are you? So, um, yeah, just getting along. But sometimes it's like the other thing about Star Trek, and this is like a Twilight Zone thing. It's like it's one thing to say that. It's one thing to say, well, of course we're gonna we're gonna enjoy diversity. But then you have and it, and the, the tried and true examples. But you've got, you know, like the Horda. It's like when you have to bust out of you. You think you've got everything covered. 
you think you're being all high and mighty and progressive and idealistic and even handed and, you know, future looking and all that. It's, I guess this is the other thing about real life and fandom. It's like, and it goes back to when you came in and you enjoy what it is you do the way you do it and you always have. But if you stay in your, in your rut, if you stay in your trench too long, you get, you get the blinders, the horse blinders. And you don't realize the world may be changing, or at least the world may be flaking. And sometimes you get caught with your pants down, or you get caught with the blinders on, I guess is a better thing. And sometimes you may be, you know, you may be going on and on and on about how, oh, DS9 was the dark, gritty show. Oh, DS9 was just TNG light. Oh, DS9 was this, 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 you know, criticism. Here's your list of 24 criticisms. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and this other bulk of the world is going, DS9 <laughs> is the best show to stand the test of time ever. It presaged serial storytelling and all these characters. And, the sh you know, in the old days, it's like, oh, it doesn't go anywhere. It's not on the ship. They're not going to a planet every week. But what I'm saying is if you don't, if you don't, and if you don't care, that's fine. If you want to sit in your basement and watch your same favorite show or even favorite season over and over and over again, that's fine but you're missing out but the one thing not to yeah. do is to think you're on top of everything and to think you're out there and you've some way and sometimes it may not just be you sometimes you may have a very big club <laughs> there may be a whole ton of people who don't get what the new not just the new hot thing but you don't know you know we have the generation labels which i think are stupid at times but it is true that we all came up with different things shaping our childhoods and how we dealt with people and technology and history and was it a good time to be alive was it a crappy time to be alive and then if you survive that does the good turn crappy or does the crappy get you know that's all shaped what we are and everybody gets lost in the gen i mean i'm still trying to figure out exactly what that means to me the baby boomers were they were born when nobody had babies and then the world got better and everybody had babies for 20 years and then they got tired of having babies and the baby boom stopped that always made total sense to me <laughs> It's all the other ones, like, were you a latchkey kid, or did you grow up with an iPhone? I mean, it's like, okay, that's that's harder to think about. But all that stuff is valid, and the worst thing you can do is, no matter how old you are or what your generation is or what your favorite Star Trek is, is to get caught napping. Get caught asleep at the wheel to where you've just gone along with your opinions, and you've got your eight friends that all agree with your opinions – and you've all gone along together, but all of a sudden there's 80 or 800 out here that maybe not disagree, but just have a different slant. And I think that that catches up to all of us when we're just going through life and we're dealing with politics and, and family stuff and the way things are done and the way laws are passed and, you know, the way stores or, you know, com retail shopping is. I mean, all this stuff happens and it's just weird to think about it in our pop culture fandoms, too. But that happens, and uh, sometimes it's something changes and you want to push back on it. Like people suddenly started calling Harry Mudd a pimp when we got <laughs> to discover it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He was never a pimp. He was just like the guys that brought the brides to the Here Come the Brides guys to Seattle. That's what the whole Harry Mudd's women was based on. I, I said not the drug part, but the other part. He wasn't yeah. a pimp. Those women could take off and go off anytime they wanted to. He was not their pimp. But that was a perception that came up. You know, and it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, you know, then it's it's always easier when you, what is it? Sugar, nut, vinegar, or whatever. It's like, don't go in with an ax and try to attack everybody about it. Like, well, you know, <laughs> and come in that way. But that's that's another thing I think the last, and especially the social media era when everything is so hyped and amplified and 24 seven and, and 110 miles an hour, just remembering that maybe some things changed out there that just because you've always believed this for 10, 15, 20 years, or it was the way, not just the way you grew up, but the way you and all your buddies knew Trek, maybe there's been something different come along. And maybe the thing you always said you agreed with is actually happening over here and you just don't see it that way. But it's the same thing you always said you thought, and it probably is what you really do think. You're just not used to thinking of it that way. So, so you got yeah, me. it's the personification of the horde. It's the personification of the the uh, home soil creatures, you know, that the called us ugly bags and mostly water. It's the personification. Anytime you got a Star Trek show where you got the twist ending or like they've done on Discovery the last couple of years, not so much the kid that screams, but the um, the 10C species. 
you know, it's like you on an alien life. Well, there it sits kind of a thing. And it just that's a that's a concept, but we just keep seeing it in different ways. And so that is actually one of my favorite things to talk about is what can when we talk about what we can learn from Star Trek is what could Star Trek teach us about first contact when we do have mm-hmm. public first contact, something where it's, hey, we got the aliens here. What do you think the Star Trek's interpretation of first contact and dealing with aliens, specifically humans interacting with aliens, to what can we learn as a society or as a world? Well, I mean, the, the prime directive came out of the mess of Vietnam. So, you know, about not getting involved, not getting involved and also not messing with, I hate to say lesser, less developed cultures, say. Mm-hmm. And they use, yeah, fair. you know, warp drive as a yardstick now has become kind of solidified. But the whole thing about just not, not, um, they used to laugh about the original, one of the parodies would talk about Star Trek and the Enterprise being a Mary Worth, which is an old soap opera comic strip. You know, it was kind of like, or, or Mrs. Olsen on the old, well, I'm dating myself. The, these these commercials characters. So the woman that used to be this the lead character for Folgers Coffee, Mrs. Olson, was always running into women's kitchens and telling them how to make better coffee, you know, and and help them with their husbands or something stupid. And so, but that whole idea of the Enterprise being the do-gooder running around fixing everybody, they they guarded against it. Sometimes it came off that way, and sometimes the later generations look back and go, hmm. hmm. You know, even though you had a prime directive, it may not have been as overt as do we give guns to these lesser developed, you know, just throwing your cultural weight around maybe. And and between the 60s and 80s, that is something that got fine tuned, but maybe to the point now where it's the other extreme and you get all the Beverly Crusher. It's one thing for McCoy to argue this, but now 20 years later, even on a heightened way, you got Crusher going, you're just going to let them die of an earthquake because we have to be more advanced than they are. And, you know, well, we can't the natural order of the planet. We can't interfere in the natural, you know, so it's one thing to go. We're going to jump in here and give warp driver or or we're not going to give we're not going to give replicators to the Kazon. I mean, that's that's interesting and clear cut. But it's just this thing about we're not going to go in and save the ones we could. And then you watch all the captains who break that because one of the people about to die has been pen pals with data. Yeah. Or or the other 4,700 examples, you know? So, but this basic thing, if nothing else the Prime Directive does, if it's, just, if it's not a black and white rule, and they try to make it be, and then they people get lambasted or they ridicule it for not being followed as a black and white yeah. rule. Yeah. But at the very least, at least it makes you stop and think. And whether that means you're going to call a board meeting in the conference room or what, but at least like stop and think and examine your actions and don't just get swept up in the every a little bit like i was saying a minute ago just take a moment and examine your thought process look at your so one thing i remember learning in grad school not about theater and directing but uh examine your assumptions you know just try to stop and remember where you are and then think about what you're what you're unconsciously assuming that you're not even examining consciously that's beautiful i really like that approach it makes Give some clarity. And I never realized that the prime course, directive. Sometimes, sometimes you have to hope that you're in a place where you remember to stop and take a breath and you're even like self-aware enough to do that because we all have everyday stresses and strains and yeah. moments that we don't stop and go, now, wait a minute, I'm going to stop and examine this, you know, but if we can at least start to kind of do that, but that's what Star Trek, even if they don't follow the rules, at least stop and have a debate about it so that, you know, you have to know the remember that old thing about you have to know the rules so you know when to break them. Whether you're a writer or a director or a Starfleet officer, you know, or anybody in daily life. So that's that's one that's one thing I think is uh, that Star people like to say Star Trek messes up, but I think the main point there is you have the discussion, you have the conversation. Yeah, Star Trek opens up a discussion, so therefore there's no therefore it did succeed because if you didn't have Star Trek, you wouldn't at least be open to the idea of hey maybe we should talk about this, and because of Star Trek. Without Star Trek, you might have talked about it, and maybe from that discussion, yeah. some clarity might have come out of it. So that if is some... something else. The gift that Star Trek gave us in the '60s and continues to, when it's at its best, is at least if we don't have problems, if if we're not a a, a Mary Worth, if we're not a you know soap mm-hmm. opera fix it lady, uh, at least we're having the conversations where maybe it was totally off the radar before. 
and no one even stopped to think about it, including the people whose lives might even be affected that way and don't even stop to think about it. Yeah. And so now, bang, we're into all kinds of cultural and, and gender and, you know, just contact with what? On Earth, much less out in space. Question about the Star Trek. Uh, you talked about these different types of people, um, individuals. I mean, have have you seen the type of fans of Star Trek evolve from the days of, you know, next gen to where we are now? Like we just were at Star Trek LV, you know, how have they evolved or stayed the same um, in your opinion? Well, this is another thing that I think just the span of just the span of Star Trek time has been fun. like there there was a time maybe 10, 15 years ago when I think a lot of fans saw more more women coming into fandom or something in the early aughts and thought that there was this whole talk about geek girls and nerd girls and some of them were posers and they were all coming over from anime fandom maybe as the comic con started mixing the franchises you know yeah. which was just hysterical to me because you go back and look at the you know, for one thing the zine writers the fan fiction writers were all women because of spock and vulcans and the sexual allure of you know not to not to box it up too tightly but 90 percent of active fandom and the fan leaders who were making clubs doing zines definitely and then kind of doing clubs and then the first conventions look at who did the first new york convention it was 95 percent women and so that was a funny thing to me i was like what how did we lose track of this little simple bit of history here in just 20 like what happened here like generational change and part of that was the internet and social media was coming along. And the image, I swear to God, I go back to that Saturday Night Live, the Get a Life sketch. I remember when that was on and it's Shatner, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I think everybody knows it. And he's he's lambasting the audience at his convention and they cut to who, now it's Saturday Night Live and they have no budget, but they show who's in the audience and who is, it's all a bunch of teenage pimple faced boys. And I remember watching that in 86 live and going, where are all the middle-aged women? <laughs> you know, much less the younger women. But I was like, that's not the fandom that I read in Interstat every month who are arguing about, you know, Spock and and Idic and Pon Far. So that's one thing. It's like there was a but now that's ha- that's we're past that. That was a that was a moment in time 10, 15 years ago that has, has thankfully gone away. But that's the thing about fandom as its own history. Things like that, I think we we get. But one thing that I may have may have gone away was back in the simple days, pre social media, when everything was local and you knew the fans you knew, and clubs would get together and you would have personality. You know, you'd have the one that wanted to be president for life of your fan club. <laughs> you'd have the one that wanted to tell everybody. You'd have the quiet ones that would do all the work. You know, you had all kinds of personality types, and then inevitably. And I, you'd see this all the time with clubs. You'd get a club that, it, especially with the old Starfleet chapters or with convention organizing teams, somebody would get enough of a team together to put on a convention. It was small, but it survived. It didn't go broke. I mean, maybe it did go broke. Maybe they out, they're, they're, they were too starry-eyed and wanted to pal around with stars and didn't think about real business. And that would happen in the 70s and 80s. But you would have somebody that was a success. And then they would have a fight and they'd split off. And you'd have two competing conventions, you know, or you'd have clubs almost multiplying like cellular division. You know, there'd be eight of them. Well, four would get up and leave and they'd be like little churches fighting and running off and starting new churches. Only it was Starfleet chapters or or any kind of a club. And you would have that a lot in the old days. And it was just personalities and people would go oh, fandom. And I go, you know what? I bet this happens in. With all the uh, like the women's every other Thursday quilt uh, quilting leagues. I mean, it's like, I bet human personalities do this with any time you've got social. Yeah. And the people that go, I just wanted a club for fun. I didn't want all this political, you know, and when they say political, they usually meant like ego headbanging kind of stuff, you know, personality types coming in, into conflict. And that was a that was a thing. But so I don't know if that has calmed down or if social media just lets those kind of people go have their th- I mean, we still have a whole range of personality types and. And, you know, thank God we do. We're not all drones. But uh, for some reason, it's like all that kind of drama, either it's been upstaged or it seems to have gravitated to the social media world. So. 
But having said that, the people who get depressed at what fandom looks like online, I and it kind of hit a peak, and then I think it's backed off. I think it hit a peak when, well, this Gamergate happened, you know, and then the Star Wars stuff, and then when Discovery. I think a lot of that wasn't so much about the fandoms. It was just like people realizing they can use social media for social disruption and not make us all happy, even when we're supposed to be dealing with the things that make us happy. Yeah. And I think part of that, you, you, there's documentaries about Facebook now. I mean, like we're, we're getting savvier now about, about all that. But I think just the longer things go on, we get savvy that way. Just like, you know, 20 years ago, people would ask dumb questions of actors. And I say dumb, I, there's no dumb question, but we're so much savvier about media and the business of media. In fact, it's almost like we've lost our innocence. But since social, that's one thing. So now we're in the middle of these labor strikes. And even the strike in 07 and 08, the fandoms of Star Trek and all the things that were represented by the writers then, we were much savvier then and way more now about how that business and that industry works so that we knew which side to be on. Uh, which side that if we if we cared about what we said we cared about, we were we were for the writers or for the creators. So that's one thing as the years have gone by on one hand, I think I think fandom has gotten savvier and there's and there's more stuff. You can watch a YouTube. You didn't have to wait for the making of Star Trek book to come out <laughs> and go, oh my God, this is amazing. Now that's everywhere all the time. And and that kind of that so that's a good education. Unfortunately, it's the same tool that gets you that is the same thing that can misinform in all kinds of ways. But I even think the toxic tube the to, toxic tubers, I used to call them. I think they're people have become so savvy now. And we've seen the years go by and we can't be manipulated that way. Or a lot of newer fans who weren't as set hadn't been around the block as much. And I don't think they're so yeah, I think sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, the Con of Wrath, my documentary, we talked about the whole thing about women in fandom. There were tons of them in 1982, but also like what cell phones and immediacy and social media have done versus the 80s. And so there's a lot of we talk a lot there, but there's a lot that's changed. Like you could pick up a phone now and settle something without having it be a big drama. And there's a lot of things that are exactly the same. <laughs> Fans awesome. can still be snarky. Fans can still go through their own therapy of when they're disappointed by their heroes or their 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 franchise. They can still turn to parody and satire and, you know, just being snarky about it and do, you know, do shit posting now or do do memes to get the point across. So we've got new tools now, but that's that's always been part of fandom. I think um, and thank you for that. It's a really good explanation of the evolution of the Star Trek fandom. And I think. To, to kind of conclude it, I mean, we talked about the origins of where Star Trek has gone, where Star Trek is growing, how the fans have evolved or not evolved, the lessons we can learn. I think let's sum it up with wh what excites you about Star Trek in the future. And this could be its impact on society. It can be the way the shows are being developed. What is it like? What are you excited about? Well, I'm excited about a lot of Let me throw one tiny little thing in what you just said. The other thing that just caught everybody by surprise i think and part of that blinders on the whole the the gatekeeping and the anger and bots and trolls with discovery coming back and people jumping on some some bits and having this mix about people who had honest critiques with just the fact that star trek was now back in the spotlight and people saw it as a vehicle to go in and and uh and exploit for division which is sad yeah and the fandom itself being confused about that and i think we've gotten savvier about that but what it points to to me was i always defended the people People would lump in the trolls and the bots with the people who really had a legitimate criticism of Discovery or Strange New Worlds or Picard or Lord or whatever. And I always wanted to say, look, back in the old days when we had our eight friends, there was always the one guy, maybe girl. There was always the one guy who was always the beginner. Yeah, he was the yeah. one that was like, eh. yeah. But he, but you yeah. loved him. He was always in your. You never like kicked him out. He was always the one that would go, eh. So. His type is still out there. He just gets lumped in, you know, and sometimes it was a whiny thing. Sometimes he had a good point, you know, but I mean, but there was always the one that didn't just go along with the herd, but you knew him personally. So it was okay, you know, unless they did something. So I was like, a lot of these people, they're still those people. It's just that now we're on social media and we don't know people personally. So part of this I said was people that are like that i saw it when people were upset about the klingons being changed in discovery 
at first. And I heard a heartfelt fan look at Mary Chifo and Ken Mitchell and Akiva Goldsman and say, whatever happens, please just don't take my childhood away from me. You know, and that's not a bot and a troll. That's like a sincere person, you know, whatever. And so part of that is, again, the years going by <laughs> have given some, some, you know, some um, leavening to this. But part of this is people, part of the negativity that people see comes out of not so much anger, but it comes out of fear because people do care so much that they are afraid when they think they're going to lose it. And if people were, if people didn't care, A, we wouldn't have Star Trek after 60 years. It would be my mother, the car or something. I mean, <laughs> you know, it would be. So the fact that people care so much is why we have debates and whether it's a good old fan bar debate, you know, whose captain would win in a fight or something ridiculous or whose ship would win, you know, but these major concepts. So if, if we look at that as people being fearful that something they love, love, love is going to be changed by people who don't know what they're doing <laughs> until they prove themselves. So that was that was one thing. So the thing I'm excited about for the future is the fact that we've got to a point, and I know they're looking at streaming now and going, well, maybe this wasn't going to work out with this as a model. But I remember back in the day thinking we're going to be stuck with this period of Picard, Janeway, Cisco forever because they've invested so much in the sets and props and costumes. And now between the AR wall technology and CGI ships, uh, much less rooms, and the fact that they're looking at smaller platform, like leaner, meaner platforms for things, the idea that we can have it. I mean, I would love to have more than 10 episodes a year of Strange New or anything else or Legacy or whatever. But the fact that they're looking, the idea now is let's go different angles with these shows and we're not stuck in something for forever and ever and ever. That's what's exciting to me because I wanted, I still want my Romulan War founding of the Federation show and Enterprise got cut off too soon. When it got caught up in the, you know, just the implosion of Star Trek and the and the Berman universe then. But now it's a doable thing. Or now we can just do a couple of two hour. Now they want to do two hour TV movies on Paramount Plus without it being a big, risky theatrical movie. And that's awesome. So the technology and the uh, the um, mindset about how to platform and scale and budget has got to the point now where we can tell a variety. And Short Treks was even part of that it was almost like lab theater in, in a small way yeah and so if we can do that now with two hour movies and maybe two and three hour miniseries that's awesome and that's what i'm excited for but most of all people were scared to see uh a comedy people were scared to see an animated show people were scared to see a musical episode and every time still cr critique critique whatever you feel sincerely about but people, we've all gotten through all these iterations and changes now and said, oh, you know, we're going to bring back the old Picard crew. Aren't they too old to do anything? I'd love to do it, but how are you going to, you know, oh, here's what we can do. How are you going to display the X, fill in the blank? How are you going to show Hordas? How are you going to show Tellarites? How are you going to show whatever? Oh, here's how we can do it. So if nothing else, I think we're so much more, people have have been shown it's like missouri it's like how are we going to do this oh look don't worry we can handle it or here's our first stab now we're going to tweak it a little bit it'll be even better and i think people maybe they're getting more and more to the point where they don't automatically fear the next new way you know the next new format or the next new approach or the next new thing and maybe we're getting to where we see oh this they really can handle technology and production and and the diversity of star trek really does come back around to let you have a diversity of shows and formats. So I think that's what I'm the most, and the fact that the outside world and the mundane world and the bean counters and the execs all see that now. Yeah. So that's what I'm excited for the most. We live in a golden era of Star Trek, I feel. It really is, yeah. And not just because we're counting how many hours are being put on a screen, but because of those kind of, uh, you know, abilities and, out and um uh, outlooks on what we what can be done as opposed to what's impossible and what's just crazy well larry i gotta say this was a very insightful conversation i've never had a conversation with anyone on the history of star trek in a way with you you are you've definitely earned the name dr trek where did you get that name by the way did you create that someone call you uh, that so 12 years ago when i was coming back out with my blog and trying to create something uh saying the author editor 
interviewer, host, archivist, historian is long and boring and blah, blah, blah. And I need something to make it shorter. And I had a couple of marketing and business friends who said, you need something like the mayor of Trekville or the doctor, you know, and I was like, no, that's so cheesy. That's horrible. That's horrible. That's stupid. And they're like, I don't know. It's what you need. And I'm like, no. And I have friends, people I've known. How can I look at anybody that works in Star Trek and have them go, really, really? Or other people who are experts in Star Trek and go, oh, really? You're like, how can I do that? But when I was um, a fan I wrote a column that was supposed to be, hey, I in our fan club in Oklahoma before I published the companion and while I was doing the companion. And I had a column called Ask Dr. Trek, and it was just to be like, hey, if you've got a question, Larry can probably answer it or tell you where to go because I could even in the 90s. And it turned into not being that at all. No one ever actually wrote a question. It turned into me just sharing the synopsis <laughs> from the shows coming out that were being mailed out. But that was a thing that stuck in my head. So when people were saying 12, you know, it's a new age, everybody's blogging, everybody's had a personality. Like it wasn't even a YouTube world yet. And uh, I said, okay, okay, I'm going to use this Dr. Trek. I'm not going to do the mayor of Trekville. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do Dr. Trek. And um, because I had this huge fight over somebody that wanted to call me uh, the world's the world's biggest Star Trek expert or something. I go, no, no, no. There's other people that can claim that. So we came up with all these fudge words, like the foremost, like no superlatives, just good word. Anyway, but the beauty of Dr. Trek is that when some radio station or TV station, if somebody wants to introduce me and they need a Chiron, they need a two-line thing, they can just say Dr. Trek and it gets the meaning across. That's awesome. Well, Larry, so, before, before we go, where can people find you? <clears throat> Uh, Larry Nimichek.com is will get you to everything. Portal 47, my podcast, uh, The Trek Files for Roddenberry, and uh, and Second Opinion, and Trekland Tuesdays Live, and Portal 47, our backstage uh, fan deep dive business, and Trekland Treks Tours, and whatever else I'm doing at the moment is all at my website. 